the Mind Body Connection podcast. The body and mind. With your host, Dr. Phil Parker. Hi, and welcome. Today we've got the pleasure of having Professor John Froyland talking about his work in the field of positive psychology, autonomy, helping students to learn. He's uh, working at Purdue University in the Department of Education, Educational Psychology, and we're going to talk about all sorts of things related to how do you get your kids to do their homework without hating you? What is the positive effect on your body of being intrinsically motivated, which means deciding you want to do something because you want to do it, because you can see there's value in it, as opposed to doing it because you should, and more besides. So let's go. So welcome, John. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, We're recording this, as I mentioned before, we started on election day. Um, So let's see what we can do in this conversation to help everybody feel happy and positive and and optimistic about the future. Um, In the introduction, we already talked a little bit about, you know, who you are and what you do. Today's conversation is going to be about the mind-body connection, the mind and the body and how it all fits together. And I usually start the podcast by asking simple kind of interesting question which is for you what's your definition or experience of the mind body connection what does that mean to you uh the way i got interested in it um was when i was starting to develop intervention studies on teaching parents how to be autonomy and relatedness supportive and one of the outcomes i was interested in is psychosomatic symptoms or psychosomatic complaints like headaches muscle tension um uh, stomach aches and uh, others, you know, because those are symptoms of anxiety, for instance, and uh, children often. And uh, when I taught the parents in the treatment group how to be more autonomy supportive and how to help the kids to set their own intrinsic life goals, where you focus more on helping others and growing instead of grades and pressure and stress and things like that, uh, the kids actually in the treatment group relative to the control improved in terms of less. Um, stomach aches, headaches, and muscle tension. So uh, that's one example of where I um, got interested in the mind-body connection. Okay, so let's just uh, rewind. One of the things I like to do on this um, the podcast is explain any technical jargon that sneaks into the conversation. So we've got autonomous. Do you want to just describe what that means to people? Which, which part? Uh, autonomous or autonomy. Oh, yeah. Um, autonomous motivation is where you do things because – you want to do it. You see the purpose, the value in it. Um, a lot of people might not even realize it, but they sort of have what's called controlled motivation, where they're doing things out of a sense of uh, only obligation, pressure, uh, avoiding guilt, avoiding shame, avoiding fear, uh, and also to get rewards, like kind of like the carrot and the donkey. Uh, the donkey chasing the carrot and avoiding the stick, you know, that's extrinsic regulation. Uh, so yeah, autonomous motivation is where you really see a a reason for doing things. Yeah, we'll be talking a lot more about that because that's really interesting. So many people have spent their their lives being forced extrinsically to do things or to avoid or for shoulds for obligations, and so many of us are personally used to that kind of style of motivation that we grew up with. And a lot of your work is on the opposite side of it. What happens? If you, if you can help people to learn how to motivate themselves, what are the, the consequences of that? And obviously that's what you're talking about in this study. And you found, you found a change in a whole bunch of symptoms. And, and there was an interesting phrase you used, which was psychosomatic symptoms. And the word psychosomatic obviously means kind of mind and body. Do you see that there's a difference between uh, the mind and the body, that they're interconnected, that some symptoms are... Uh, perceived to be in the stomach but really are just in the mind or you know what's what's your take on this whole psychosomatic conversation well it is interesting i remember once i was doing cognitive behavioral therapy with a student and she was telling me about her stomach aches and she had a lot of anxiety and also depression and so we just started talking about things she was interested in and happier moments in her lives things like that and she not only started to feel happier, but she said, Oh, wait, my stomach aches gone, you know? So, um, 
you know, it's, it's cool to see um, when, when that can happen. Of course, you know, if they have persistent stomach aches or something like that, it's always good to collaborate with the, uh, the nurse or physician or physician assistant and so on uh, to make sure there isn't some kind of uh, physical illness causing the, the symptoms. Yeah, I mean, what happens, of course, in a lot of, lot of cases is when you have something symptom, symptomatic and you get it investigated, there's a large percentage of people where there's nothing to see. You know, there's like, well, there is no organic cause and there's no pathology that we can identify, particularly in things like stomach. And, and of course, pain is the other classic one where, you know, in many, many cases of pain, it's not because you still have a pin in your foot that your foot hurts. Uh, and a lot of the work that we do is in people who've got stuck into that chronic cycle where it seems like the pain almost is an echo, is like a memory that keeps on being amplified or sensitized to. So your work around um, autonomy, uh, there's lots of interesting questions. So first of all, tell us a bit about your understanding of why when people are intrinsically motivated so that you know they're driven because they're interested and passionate about something why that has an effect on their physical health oh why why intrinsic motivation has an effect on physical health um it's just it had you know it's amazing it has so many benefits um you know, in positive psychology, they talk a lot about gratitude journals, and I've, I've studied that as part of a comprehensive psychology class I've tested, and uh, mindfulness theory is really awesome, and um, acts of kindness, especially if they're created, and also if they're driven by intrinsic life goals instead of just doing acts of kindness to get points for a class or something. Um, but uh, the fascinating thing about intrinsic motivation, in one article, I called it the nexus between psychological health and academic success, uh, simply because it just uh, is, it leads to such a plethora of benefits. Um, so, you know, increased creativity, increased happiness. It's, it's often overlooked as a great pathway to happiness. Um, and of course, if you're happier, that often helps with your, your health. And, um, you know, people that are depressed have less energy in general. Uh, and unless they might have sleep issues, oversleeping or undersleeping, so they have less energy for exercise. And uh, I've sometimes consulted on building intrinsic motivation for exercise as well uh, and with physical education in, in particular, um, you know, in addition to learning from kindergarten to uh, college and so on. So we're going to come to some of the studies you've done because I think people will also be particularly interested in uh, parental influences on learning because I'm sure there'll be a lot of people listening who are parents or going to be parents or want to be better parents uh, around that. But there's some stuff that uh, you said there that reminds me of some really interesting studies that I think are worth mentioning. So there's the, the, the famous Langer and Rodin study, which I'm sure you know about, where they looked at autonomy in care homes for the, for the elderly. And they found that if they gave people, it was a long, long ago now in the study, I think in the 70s, they found that if they gave people the, the chance to decide, you know, when they had meals and which TV channels they watched, and they were allowed to choose that for themselves, as opposed to the people that caring for them who would just put the channel on and just give them the food, that there was a massive increase in their levels of subjective happiness and well-being and then later on 18 months later somebody who was blinded to the study looked at people's health and found that the people who had autonomy had much improved health and that really transformed um, geriatric care at that point point. and of course the other study that i think is important is diner and chan study from about 2011 when they measured people's subjective well-being happiness and and see it and saw a really strong correlation with health outcomes and longevity of about on average 10 years the happiest people were had had a 10-year uh, longevity compared to their more grumpy friends which as we often say is like smoking you know smoking on average will be 10 to 14 years impact on your life so the worst thing you can be is a grumpy smoker if you're going to smoke at least be happy because the combination of those two things are not factors you want to have in your life and ideally be a non-smoker non and be happy so yeah there's some really interesting research coming up all about this kind of stuff which is quite surprising for people i think people are like well just being able to decide about what you you want and how you're going to uh, make those choices have a direct impact on your physical health, but the evidence is starting to build. 
on that. So tell us a bit about uh, one of your studies you did about uh, parental styles in terms of helping kids to uh, do homework. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Oh, yeah. Um, well, a lot of times parents, you know, they have this strong, super strong desire for their kids to achieve a lot, to excel. They might even want them to achieve in sports and academics in ways they didn't quite achieve. Um, and so a lot of parents put a ton of pressure on their kids to excel, even to the point where a kid might come home with an 89 out of 100 on a test or, uh, you know, a piece of writing. And the parent just focuses on the 11 points they got wrong and all the mistakes they made. Even I've worked with parents that are so perfectionistic that the kid got a 99 and he hears a, he or she hears about that one point that they missed and they're beating themselves up. First, the parents beating them up, maybe, uh, you know, with words. And then later, the kid internalizes this as an older student, like in high school, for instance, in college. And now they're beating themselves up about their mistakes. And then they, they become, uh, they get to the point where they fear mistakes and avoid challenges. And this can happen as early as third grade, where you'll find kids that um, will choose an easier task over a hard task. Like they'll read a book that's too easy for them because then they'll make less mistakes and have less trouble comprehending it. But um, it's actually better for them to take on a, a book that's slightly above their uh, current reading level. And, and younger kids like below third grade and uh, will take on cognitive challenges. They'll take on uh, something that's a little above their current level of understanding and intelligence. Uh, but as kids learn, unfortunately, learn the wrong thing, that, that failure is terrible and horrible and mistakes are to be avoided, they start to um, fear mistakes. And it's this tremendous opportunity to learn. So that's one of the things. There's uh, 22 components I talk about. Um, in my book, Inspired Childhood, and in my intervention research on autonomy support, where one of the things is teaching kids to embrace mistakes as stepping stones instead of stumbling blocks as great opportunities to learn. Uh, others, another one is patient communication. Often parents, you know, say they were in rush hour traffic on the way home. They have all these deadlines, even with COVID, they might not be in traffic, but, you know, they have all these uh, meetings and stuff online. And uh, due dates and so on. And so when they talk to their kids about their online homework or whatever, or their live homework, uh, their live classes or online, uh, they're, they're rushing the conversation. So they say, why didn't you do your homework? And the kids thinking about how to respond, if they don't get an instant response, the parent will sometimes then, you know, ask another question. And that becomes like interrogation, you know, from a detective or something. And the kid gets more and more defensive and the, the conversation breaks down. And now the relationship can actually be damaged over many micro interactions like this. So uh, we teach the parents a more autonomy and relatedness, supportive way of communicating, more patient, even using the power of silence. I talk about with parents how silence can be almost golden at times. And, um, in one study, uh, we found I found that um, if parents just listen, uh, just watch a kid work on their problem while they appear to be stuck, give them another ten to fifteen seconds at that point at which they appear to be stuck. The parent and they and combine that silence with non judgment. Combine that silence with unconditional positive regard and just kind of warmly attending to the child. Then the child keeps working on the problem and often makes progress during that fifteen seconds. Whereas if the parent like tries to fix the situation and start doing the task for the child, the child gets defensive or over-reliant on the parent and so on. Yeah, I think that, that the opportunity to give a little bit more space and time is really important. I think, and I, I suspect what's happening is different neural networks are waking up or different effective states are occurring where people are able to just think differently. There's some interesting studies about... Um, as a task study, they, they got people to think about um, different uses for, for household objects. So they give them a coat hanger and say, all right, 20 things you could do with that. And then, you know, and then another one and another 20. And people ran out of ideas after a while. And then they got them in three different groups. They said, right, one of you guys just go and uh, just go and think some more. One of you go and do something creative. And one of you go and do something really boring. And the people who did the boring um, job which was washing up or cleaning or something they only got them all back 
and said, right, here's a think of another 20 tasks. And the people that did the most tedious job that had more creativity. It seemed like by switching off your kind of part of your brain that's been working hard at that problem and activating a different part of your brain gives some different processing, maybe at a kind of subcortical level or some kind of unconscious level. Uh, so that opportunity to kind of think differently, uh, to give a bit of space, is really interesting. And yeah, do, that, parents, do parents take to that? Are they happy to kind of step away where they're normally jumping and, yeah? Oh, right. Did, yeah, I mean, what you were, like it? that made me think of uh, times where I was trying to solve a complex data analysis um, for a study or something like that. And uh, the solution or epiphany came to me while swimming or <laughs> in between playing beach volleyball and stuff like that. So you kind of rest your mind in a way. Uh, I tr that's another thing I teach kids that feel like they're wasting time, like say on math, when they work hard on a problem. And I teach parents and teachers that teach kids this. Uh, kids will say, yeah, if I work on a problem 10 minutes and don't solve it, it was a total waste of time. I failed. Uh, but I, I say, if you go to the gym and you're trying to do 40 push-ups and you do 30, did you fail? And they're like, no, I got an exercise, right? And eventually I'll get to 40. And so um, I help them to see it like that as mental exercise, kind of fitting along with growth mindset theory. Um, intrinsic motivation can go really well with that. Um, and I'm doing some studies related to that too. But anyways, uh, yeah, that they see it as this rigorous mental exercise. And then they, and, and there's that, it's kind of a cool mind body analogy too, right? Because uh, you can even talk about the, the neurons, uh, the dendrites making connections and so on. And they'll be like, oh, what about when I'm reviewing things and we can talk about myelinization and so on and uh, things like that. Um, you know, making the speed of information travel faster in your brain through reviewing things over and over. So uh, being more cognitively efficient. Um, so, yeah. Um, I think that's a really, really nice idea. And we have a whole thing about fail failure. Humans generally have a very poor relationship to things not turning out as they hoped, which is what it really means. And a lot of the work we do is helping people to recognize exactly that, that what if we don't class it as that? What if we don't code it as failure instead? We just go, that's feedback, that's information from the system saying that didn't work out the way you wanted to. What could you do differently? But I really like what you just said there about, because if you look at math, you know, you're doing a sum. If you don't get the answer out, you know, you've got nothing to, you know, in terms of when you're presenting your results, you're like, I ain't got nothing. Um, but this idea that, well, it's not just about the answer. It's a, it is about that process of learning how to find your way through that is, is very interesting and something that is, is really important to encourage because we know, uh, and you can talk about this in, in, a, in a minute, actually, that we know that, um, this kind of extrinsic motivation or doing things in order to not, to avoid something or to tick some box, not only is not very effective in terms of academics it has all sorts of other implications in terms of life um so t tell us a bit more about what are the positive benefits of the intrinsic learning and intrinsic motivation or autonomous style early on in life what kind of consequences could that have for people well one powerful thing is that uh if a child is learning to focus primarily on a love for learning for s driving their studies and um their homework and things like that. And also a love for others is the reason, you know, an intrinsic, a pro-social intrinsic motivation for treating others well, instead of just trying to get candy, you know, uh, points, coupons from the school store, you know, getting trinkets and toys. Uh, in one study I did, a parent called it, um, said my child is now motivated by feathers. Like uh, he would behave really well in school all day and he'd earn a feather, or enough points to buy a feather at the school store. And uh, anyways, uh, you know, if they're being conditioned for that kind of thing, it's like uh, eventually they're going to be the type of adult that sets extrinsic life goals um, or a high school student and, and later into adulthood. And uh, but if they're really focusing on intrinsic motivation, they'll set intrinsic life goals in adolescence and adulthood. And that's kind of the becomes the pro-social type of citizens we really want in our world and in our nations where you're you really one of your goals for going to work each day and uh, learning more and things like that is is to grow as a person, to help others, to make the world a better place. 
uh, in the physical health realm, realm and intrinsic life goal is to become more fit instead of just to look good. So I've worked with college students and high school students on that, for instance, where, you know, they've been focusing, they've been depressed and even had a distorted body image sometimes by over-focusing on looks and impressing others. And now they're, now, now they're focusing on fitness for the joy of fitness, the, sometimes because they enjoy exercising with other people. Other times they're focusing on longevity so that, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm likely to live longer, be there for my, my future grandchildren. I could teach longer. Uh, sometimes I work with a lot with teachers and uh, they'll have more energy for teaching, need less sick days and all sorts of benefits like that. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's really uh, fascinating to um, help people to develop intrinsic motivation and eventually focus more on intrinsic life goals. The extrinsic life goals are like focusing more on money, uh, popularity, which a lot of high school students really struggle with. And some people are overly focused on fame or something like that, or just local popularity. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, looking good or impressing others. So uh, and that's becoming more and more problematic with the, the rise of social media, particularly amongst the young people have, you know, having to get likes, having to look good, having to, oh, don't take my profile picture from that side, only from this side, mom, you know, that kind of conversation. And uh, and I think it also leans into a bigger conversation, which you kind of touched on, which is about the world, you know, that the, the world is in a bit of a funny space at the moment, you know, not only with what's going on in, in the divisions that are quite clearly erupting in america and covid and it's it's a very strange time um do you think the world is heading to more intrinsic uh recognition of intrinsic ideals or away from what's your take on that i mean we know what the answer should be but (laughs) where do you think we are going at the moment the research is definitely advancing and uh there's a lot of interest i'm seeing in the research like uh uh, I met a, a lawyer that's on the school board in Nevada that said she was using ideas from one of my articles on the intrinsic motivation as the nexus between psychological health and academic success to help influence ideas through, throughout um, Nevada in the schools. And uh, like the, Car- the Colorado Department of Education um, has uh, a standard now that teachers are encouraged, highly encouraged um, to whether it's physics or physical education, preschool through 12th grade, let kids know the meaning or purpose of why they're teaching this content strand or this new topic. And so, uh, of course, I talked to the Colorado Department of Education and they didn't at the time have the funding to send visitors out or, you know, state observers to see the extent to which they were doing that, or let alone help them improve in that area. But at least it, they took the time to write it into the standards to highly encourage uh, teachers and principals to make sure that that's happening. So, uh, you know, there's progress uh, happening, more awareness of intrinsic motivation. And one way I found that schools become more interested in intrinsic motivation is by talking about what they're all interested in, that's behavioral engagement. And that kind of connects to the body in a way because, uh, for instance, in one of my studies with Frank Worrell at UC Berkeley, we found that intrinsic motivation is a super strong predictor of behavioral engagement. So if I love learning I'm way more likely to pay attention in class, uh, ask more questions to the teacher or professor, uh, take notes, you know, things like that, behavioral signs of engaging. And so uh, almost every school wants to increase behavioral engagement and attendance and intrinsic motivation is a strong predictor of that. And it's actually a stronger predictor of uh, behavioral engagement than behavioral rewards. And so most schools, if you ask them what they're doing for motivation in the U.S., they're giving a lot of trinkets out, school stores, points, gold stars. Uh, Praise is the best thing they're doing uh, for that. And then I work with them on speaking, uh, using praise wisely, like in an autonomy supportive way. Instead of saying good job, good job, you know, it's real authentic praise, informational, lets them know what they did well. So they believe they can keep doing more of this. And. Uh, kind of points them, uh, like uh, also rich feedback, like helping them to see where they were treated, where they showed finesse, where they um, 
really showed growth and progress and um, all sorts of things like that. To, it can The feedback and the praise a teacher gives can actually build the relationship with the, uh, the teacher student and, and meet this powerful need for relatedness that most people across the world have, this need to be connected. And of course, the more that they develop that positive relationship with an external person, the more chance they can generate some internal structures like that, some good positive self-talk, which I know is another thing that you're, you're, you're fascinated in. And so am I. I mean, I look a lot at language, both language in, within communication between you and me, between a doctor and a patient, between a teacher and a pupil, but also probably even more importantly is what is the self what's the quality of self-talk because it's a given that everybody talks to themselves the question is what are they saying what kind of things are they saying what's your take on self-talk is that a big thing for you 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 have an interest in that thing yeah i started to really um well i i've used self-talk a lot when i was a school psychologist for k-12 through students i had them work on that from a cognitive behavioral therapy perspective but also combining in positive psych and intrinsic motivation um but where i really got interested in autonomy supportive self-talk and i'm working on a new article related to that is I taught college students in a positive psychology class and I studied the effects of the class and it increased their gratitude by like a standard deviation from, uh, you know, over 16 weeks and it helped increase their positive emotions toward learning by like 0.8 standard deviations, which both are strong effects. So that was really cool. Um, But now I'm working on the qualitative side of the study. And the cool thing about that is I have their gratitude journals their autonomy supportive communication that they used with others, but I also said they could use it with themselves, uh, with themselves and also uh, their intrinsic life goals. Um, and what's really interesting is I look at how they journal about autonomy supportive com- uh, communication with themselves and others. I realized that when they wrote their intrinsic life goals, that's one form of autonomy supportive self talk. Like, uh, you know, they'll say, like, I didn't feel like exercising today. Um, but then I remembered, you know, I want to exercise more so I can live longer and help people more. Um, or it's not just about looking good. It's, you know, it's actually in finding some kind of meaning and purpose in the exercise and challenging myself to grow and all that kind of stuff. And some will, they'll say how they ended up working out longer because they enjoyed it more. They're looking forward to their next workout more. Um, they're making more progress than they ever had before. I had one person just interview me um, for 30 minutes. Um, and she later, um, wrote on LinkedIn, how she lost, uh, 30 pounds, just applying intrinsic life goals and autonomy supportive self-talk. Um, and she had tried like every kind of diet. Of course, that's not a study, right? It's just a one person testimony or anecdote, but it was, it's just kind of cool to see that, um, she grabbed onto things during the interview and then applied it to her own life. Um, so yeah, but that's what I'm working on now is this, um, some of the examples of autonomy support they provide are really speaking to themselves more graciously, patiently, uh, uh, focus, focusing themselves more on a love for learning or at work on, um, caring about their coworkers. And some of these are college students. Uh, these are college students. So some of their jobs are like fast food or jobs that, you know, aren't the job they dreamed of yet, of course, you know? But they, they talk about how they're working at the hotel or the um, restaurant and they used to get bored or uh, feel sorry for themselves or get upset with their fellow employees. And now they're starting to communicate with their fellow employees in a more autonomy supportive way and encourage them and so on. Now they feel better or they're, they care more about their clients now than just making the, you know, the $10 an hour or whatever it is and so on. And so um it's just fun to see how they're applying it to exercise, um, work relationships, uh, all basically almost any aspect of life you can think of. So, yeah, I think it's a really important thing. And one of the, one of the things we focus on a lot in, in my work with clients is really shifting that internal conversation. And I'm always amazed at how appalling some of the conversations are that people have with themselves that if, if they said it to another human being, they would be, you know, up in front of HR or thrown out of the club. And uh, the, the thing we often say to them is, if you treated your friends like you treat yourself, would you have any? You know, if you have those kind of conversations that you're having inside your head, 
with other people, what would that, you know, what would people, what would people make of that? And people are quite shocked when they spend, because a lot of the time we're not that aware of our internal d- dialogue. It's just the back, background. When they kind of bring to the foreground, they're like, oh my goodness, I could spend so much time being hard on myself. Like you were saying about the, the parents, that 99.9% is good, but what about the 0.1%? Those kind of conversations are kind of endemic. And you have to ask yourself, well, what would be the consequence to the nervous system, to the sympathetic nervous system, constantly being on alert? What would have, what would happen to the body as a result of that? So I think it's really important stuff. And, and it's one of those things that, you know, if you scan someone's body on an MRI scan, you won't see that. Those, those things don't show up as markers in those ways, but they're, so so important and and as we said earlier about social media that's that can fuel that conversation a lot those internal damaging conversations so i think um we're moving towards the end of today it's been really interesting talking to you we're talking a lot more about um psychology particularly positive psychology so people want to listen in and want to look at some of this stuff have a look at growth mindset as supposed to fix mindsets which will come up on some other podcasts as well broaden and build theory all about how the neurology changes these are kind of core things that john's talking about but just to finish i think out of all the things you've studied if you were to give one kind of key this is my take-home message this is the most important tip i could give you from everything i've looked at what would be your kind of go-to thing this is the thing that that's worth remembering um i think it's uh it's uh, autonomy, supportive communication. Um, a lot of I've, I, I did the first intervention study in that area. There were tons of longitudinal and correlational, and, uh, so, like laboratory experiment studies that were really cool. But I, I did the first like field based treatment versus control study on that, and it's something every parent could benefit from learning. I almost said should, and of course should applies <laughs> for the controlling style. Uh, you know, like Albert Ellis used to say that people were shooting all over themselves. Like uh, they were just beating themselves up with shoulds and uh, have tos and musts. And, and really it's way more powerful to inspire yourself. And I can do this and I want to do that. I see the purpose in this. Um, but yeah, uh, that's, and, and so uh, I'm really, uh, trying to spread it as much with parents and teachers as I can. And also now with professors at the college level, um, caring about the teacher student or professor student relationship. Cause that also uh, promotes happiness. And, uh, and it's, and one way to build it is through autonomy and relatedness, supportive communication. And uh, it's, it's just so powerful. Like just one other example um, that to talk about in my book and this recent book chapter I did with uh, called Parent and Autonomy Related and Support in the handbook of uh, the Cambridge Handbook of Applied School Psychology um, is, is like a lot of parents, they, lo- they actually like their job, uh, but they're controlling with their kids and their kid wants to be an engineer like they are or a medical doctor or a nurse like they are. But when the kid is studying science or math or some related topic, uh, the parents say, get up there and do your homework, you know, and uh, never explaining to the kid, like, say, I had a parent of an, uh, who was an engineer uh, and the kid wanted to be an engineer, but he hated math. So I, I taught the parent how to explain to the child why he likes math, how it, math is useful as an engineer. They use it all the time, helps them solve meaningful problems. And now the kid got more into math, of course, but it was like the parent had this powerful way of seeing math that was really uh, practical and useful and meaningful to him. But he, when he talked about math with the kids, like do this, you have to do this. If you don't get A's in math, you're not going to be an engineer, stuff like that, all this pressure. Um, So, uh, and and this can be used by, like you were saying, a patient client relationship uh, or the physician client relationship. Uh, It can be used with employers and employees more, you know, if people speak to each other more like they would like to be spoken to, um, there's going to be a lot more happy people. And funny enough with politics, all this arguing and fighting, that makes people more entrenched. They're more likely to stay stuck in their current ideas and 
the P supposedly they're trying to influence each other by these angry tweets and all these arguments and stuff like that. But it just makes most people become more entrenched. And so if you really want to inspire somebody to change, if you believe you have a better way of doing things, uh, autonomy and relatedness, supportive way of communication makes it more likely that they will change. I actually wrote a book chapter about uh, political views and motivation um, for EBSCO. Uh, it's like a, you know, one of the search engines that creates some uh, book chapters and ways to catch up on research real quick. And, and I discussed that a little bit, but um, yeah, uh, people want to influence people, but they go about it in, in a controlling way. And it's, it's unlikely to stimulate the kind of motivation. It's just like when all these new um, uh, rules come out sometimes in some companies, you know, they're pushing for something and it just feels like a lot of pressure and people rebel against it. Uh, so it's really worth taking that extra time to let people know why you love the positive behavior, the healthy behavior, the studying, how it's meaningful, um, listening to the, the person. Often we ignore kids uh, and other people when they complain about their work or their homework because we don't want to hear anything negative. But we're worried it will bring us down. But if we really show empathy and listen to them, now they're more open to our ideas about improving you know, or changing their habits and so on. So uh, kind of like psychologists often do with their clients is they, they often maybe start with non-directive communication where they really build that therapeutic relationship before trying to help them change all aspects of their life or some important aspect. So was well, one of the most important things of any communication is that brilliant quality of rapport where, you know, you feel that somebody's got you and heard you and listened to you. And if you're a kid and all you're hearing is being no and stop that and don't do this or do right. it this way, you're not going to get that. And it's the same, interesting, of course, in all therapeutic relationships. So in psychotherapy, therapy kind of relationships, but also doctor patient relationships, the, the quality of that, you know, magical element of rapport is so important. So uh, there was a nice uh, conversation I had in the first series with uh, Professor Andrea uh, Evers, who said, and she's well known for doing amazing, you know, top level, deep science studies. And her tip was, um, if you're going to have an operation and you don't believe it's going to work, don't have it. You know, you need to have a conversation with the doctor and get your head around why it's going to work, why this is going to be useful for you before even going ahead, because there's so much physiology that will be going against you if you plow through that and not thinking it's going to work, which is a very similar conversation to what you've just said about, you know, uh, about your, the beliefs you generate about uh, how, how how excited how much do i believe in this how much is this part of me how much am i connected to this so if people want to find out more about your work particularly from a non-academic perspective uh, if their parents are listening or people want to know about this type of communication what's the easiest way to look for them to get hold of the information uh, one is my book, Inspired Childhood. It's on Amazon, for instance. And then another is uh, on Twitter. They could reach out to me at Psyche Research, uh, Dr. Happiness. Um, and uh, yeah, if, they're, if they are an academic scholar, reach out to me on ResearchGate, John Mark Froyland on ResearchGate, uh, uh, things like that. So um, Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, I hope... Uh, this evening and tomorrow morning bring more happiness to America and the country and uh, the rest of the world. And lovely to speak to you. Thanks for spending time with us today, John. And we'll catch up again soon. Yeah, thanks a lot. The Mind Body Connection Podcast. The Body and Mind.